The Inattentive HD Coalition's mission is to make it so that children with inattentive HD are diagnosed by the age of 8, and adults with inattentive HD are readily and correctly diagnosed when they seek help. Find out how and how you can help at IADHD.org. I'm so glad that you have joined us, and today we're going to talk just specifically to and about teachers and how they can help identify students with ADHD and support them. I'm Linda Rogley with the ADD Diva Network, which supports ADHD women 40 and better, as I like to call them, and I'm joined today by two of our experts. I'd like to introduce you to each of them. This is Dr. Oren Mason. Um, he is a family physician, and he practices in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He's also an assistant professor. We also have Dr. Zai Bodas. Bodas, I'm so glad I said that. Is a, she's a clinical child and adolescent psychologist. She practices in Richmond, Virginia. She has special training and skill in diagnosing and treating mental disorders that affect young patients. 30% of children with ADHD have the predominant inattentive presentation, but they're not usually diagnosed in childhood. What behaviors should teachers be on the lookout for? Do you want to start, Jai? I think the impulsive or the hyperactive type of behaviors are generally considered disruptive behaviors, and these are more noticeable behaviors. They're disruptive to the teachers. They're disruptive to their, you know, their peers, and so they get picked up very easily, but the inattentive type of behaviors don't get identified very easily. This may be the kid who is just spacing out, looking out the window. They even uh, develop some behave compensatory behaviors. They look like they're paying attention, but they're not. They don't stand out per se, right? Um, you may not notice the behaviors. Um, they may be more distracted, or they may not be following what the teacher is teaching them. When they're called out, they may not necessarily know what's going on. Uh, they see some of these behaviors, but I look at their academic work. So, di when I'm doing any kind of diagnostic testing. And you look back at their report cards and you see the, the teachers saying things like they're underachieving or they're not achieving to their potential or they could do better. You look at their error analysis. They are the, the reason why they're not making 100, even though they could make 100 out of 100, they are missing, they're forgetting to, they're making careless or not, not content based errors of being forgetful or being inattentive. The the ability of a teacher to see in a, re requires a lot more evaluation, a lot more thought, a lot more trying to find out what's happening behind what's happening. Imagining what's going on in somebody else's mind is always fraught. Mm, and course. so inattention is a best guess. Hyper hyperactivity and impulsivity can be described and measured. And but Inattention has to be suspected. It has to be sought. If we can increase our ability to suspect it and look for it, mm -hmm. we may be able to diagnose more inattention at earlier ages. Well, but it's going to take what's called in medicine a high index of suspicion. Uh, now, if you think it, you better investigate it. It's, it's, it's not good to say, well, it's there, but what's it hurting? Absolutely. If you think you see it, we really need to look. Uh, Inattention yeah. usually doesn't show up in the first week because novelty is energy. Right. And so inattentive kids often have a very good first week, maybe two, mm -hmm. and then start to slide. But by that time, the teacher may have already constructed the worry list mm -hmm. and may have some bigger fish to fry. What the schools are generally looking for, what their agenda usually is, uh -huh. is learning. If these kids' grades are fine, then they're not on that problem list. It really has to be the teacher's suspicion or the inkling that something is off, this kid is not doing as well as they could, mm -hmm. then looking for patterns, then looking for why. But that takes energy and that takes effort. How early can teachers be looking for ADHD? It, it depends on the child and it depends on the teacher. There's a lot of five and six-year-olds have pretty clear histories of inattention in preschool. But because it's so hard to diagnose, first grade, five, at least five, six years old is, is often the earliest. If you're seeing it that early, what you're seeing is a combination of things, maybe, maybe inattention with an auditory processing defect, inattention with sluggish cognitive tempo, things yes. that can't be diagnosed at five or six, but right. that do make it more apparent. We're only seeing the tip of an iceberg in in kindergarten. It's retrospective sometimes. You go back and see that, that, that it was there. You were seeing signs clear. Mm -hmm. 
impairments in their functioning. Parents may see it at home, but may not recognize it either. What I've heard that the earlier kiddos are diagnosed, the better things work for them in their future. So why is it early diagnosis so important? Early diagnosis is early intervention. Starting them on treatment <laughs> early on, so mm -hmm. they're not missing out on the learning. Essentially, the brain is able to learn and take the most that it can from the setting that it is in. That is the direct impact of treatment is that they will learn. What we are finding in early intervention is that the stimulants have a neuroprotective benefit. Over time, they're looking at the long lens of 10 to, 10 to 12 years, children are showing that the brains are approximating typical brain seeing children. Yeah, so it's, awesome. there's that benefit, but it has to be early intervention for that. The secondary benefits of treatment are self-esteem, any secondary mental health issues, anxiety, depression, and how they're internalizing their negative experiences in the world, I think. The, the word neuroprotective is much bigger and more important than it might seem. N neuroprotective means the difference between a brain not developing normally and a brain developing at least more normally, possibly actually normally. Yeah. We see underactivity in the prefrontal cortex. We see poor connectivity between the prefrontal cortex, which is where we're learning organizational principles and executive principles. We see poor connection between the prefrontal cortex and the action centers and the motor centers and the coordination centers of the brain. To be able to grow up with all cylinders firing is vastly different than to grow up trying to work around, I can't, this is hard for me to do, how am I going to do it? Not just for big projects, but that how am I going to do this occurs in a brain hundreds of times per day as new little challenges come up in new little circumstances. The neuroprotective effect of early treatment is so important. I just have to amplify that answer. This is big. It's not little. And the old notion of let's wait till somebody fails yeah. is long gone. When you say treatment, can you define what you mean by treatment? When we talk about treatment, everything has its place nothing substitutes for something else on the list. Mm. When we talk about what medications do, it's really important because they can normalize neurotransmitter levels, mm -hmm. but they don't do what exercise does. Exercise is really important for developing brains. And three res recesses a day would be my ideal high school, <laughs> much less preschool. Exercise is important. Sleep is crucial. We can't grow brains without enough sleep. It's surprising how many parents don't know how much sleep their children need. And how many schools make it hard for parents to achieve that with activities that go into hours that should be pre-bedtime? Yeah. Nutrition has been a little disappointing. Not, not that it's not effective. Good, good nutrition is important for a lot of reasons, but it doesn't really give us the gains that sleep and exercise. I, I hope Dr. Bodis is going to talk about psychosocial support because that's mm -hmm. always been and continues important. The medication sometimes it's a starting point it's definitely not the end point but many of the other interventions hinge on the medication mm -hmm. uh, aspect of the treatment then uh, the accommodations need in the classroom and psychosocial support i work with these populations i cannot tell you how many times i'm working with them largely on how they're going to or why they're going to take their medication what that means to them what the diagnosis means to them depending on the age of a diagnosis, or how they interpret that diagnosis. This is medication makes me a good kid or whether it's medication it makes me calm or I'm a bad kid, the underlying meaning that they are holding on to. Mm -hmm. So a lot of therapy focuses on what is the meaning of the diagnosis and why you need to take your medication. How do you do that? How do you establish that consistency and manage everything else? A lot of that working in therapy is really just management mm -hmm. of, of other interventions and other mm -hmm. treatments. And I just want to mention for some students, stimulants may diminish their appetite. You mentioned accommodations, which is really important. And that often is a function of having an official diagnosis. How can teachers support students who have been diagnosed with ADHD? The most important 
role that teachers play is when they are suspicious that the kid is not optimally functioning. This is a kid uh, who may not need these accommod these uh, formal accommodations, but could be really bright and gifted kids underperforming. Just noticing and, and tuning into that suspicion, tuning into any concerns that parents may bring, that this kid is just not doing their best in school. That is just as important as the kids who are clearly needing services and needing support. It's the work samples or the the habits that they are they turning things in on time. All of those issues. Uh, if the teachers can notice them, then they can provide that data to the parents. Got it. Uh, that data is critical in diagnosis. Sometimes the psychological testing data is not going to pick up these very subtle signs. That's where the teachers play a critical role. We always seek the teacher's input. So we want that data. That data is critical. How can teachers support a, a diagnosed kiddo with ADHD? I'd, I'd like to set the attitude that we need to have toward accommodations. Yeah. When somebody has an amputation of a leg and we're able to fit them with a prosthesis, mm -hmm. We don't do that hoping that someday they won't need the prosthesis. Yeah. We establish it and it remains. In 80, that concept is tough because kids are growing and the scaffolding they need is going to change. But if, if a child with all other treatments going well and humming, who still is too distractible to sit in a room and concentrate on a test, even though the medicines are optimized and the teachers and parents are supportive and the kids are doing their best, trying not to talk, trying not to move. Everybody's firing on all cylinders, but some kids still can't mm -hmm. concentrate. They need a different setting so that they can succeed the same way that the other kids succeed. Other kids who have more active filters can tolerate a few distractions, but everybody deserves a low distraction environment for testing. If we can't create it by other means, then we create it with an accommodation. And we maintain that as long as it's necessary. If brain growth and development someday improve the filtering mechanism, so that's no longer needed, we're thrilled. Mm -hmm. But if this student needs it through every class, every school, into college, into graduate school, whatever they require, we should provide it because everybody deserves the same chance to succeed. Accommodations are things that we give kids so that they can have the same chance. We shouldn't expect to withdraw them or we should be thrilled when the day comes that we get to because that's not a guarantee. The scaffolding is the biggest part of uh, support, scaffolding in school, scaffolding at home, we're getting there, but it's still sometimes just slow. It's the lens with which we look at these general mental health issues, but particularly with ADHD, it's still seen as a behavioral problem. It's a motivational problem. It is not uh, considered, a, you know, genetic, uh, biologically based, uh, or a medical concern. Right. There is a judgment about it. There's a tendency to see behaviors as good and bad. See it from the behavioral lens, mm -hmm. and then it becomes a good kid, bad kid, but uh, problem, right? Rather than this is a, a kid who has a medical issue. Yeah. I think the lens needs to change. Yeah. That circles back to the importance of early diagnosis. If I label myself a bad kid, that may carry with me for a very long time. We know how important childhood experiences are. Even when you're an adult, you deal with those childhood experiences, yeah. that's for yeah. sure. Compassion and forgiveness, I think, is, uh, is critical. I, I, I consider ADHD more of a disability. There's tracks in the brain that don't work or that are so staticky that kids can't rely on them. Just, just because we see differences in moral behavior, in rule following behavior, right. in areas that we've named maturity, doesn't mean that kids are choosing. So, sometimes we hear that phrase too much, this child isn't choosing well, which implies that we know more about what's going on in their head than we, we often know. One, one thing that I would urge people to do because it makes the compassion and forgiveness so much easier is to assume that what you're seeing is probably the best a person can do. And then asking, what would it mean if this is literally their best? What would that tell me? That question has helped me learn the compassion and forgiveness that I, 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 I think normal kids, much less kids with learning difficulties and mental health and to, disorders need. And to extend that same sort of compassion compassion to teachers and parents who are dealing with these 
really difficult behaviors. They can get under right. your skin, hard to manage in a big classroom. Viewing these behaviors from that lens of disability can really help with bringing compassion in situations where it is, when it is the hardest thing to do. You mentioned too, that sometimes there is some stigma about ADHD. Parents may not take kindly to a teacher saying to them, I think your kiddo needs an ADHD um, evaluation. How do teachers talk to parents so that you instant resistance, which you may well get? Do you have any suggestions? As a teacher, if you're really looking at this kid and or see the invisible struggle that the kid is trying, that the kid is uh, forgetting, feeling frustrated and struggling with this day in and day out, and you recognize that this seems to be beyond just a behavioral issue or a habit or disorganization related to other things. Uh, I think just having that conversation with parents, not necessarily diagnosis per se, because I think the teachers don't feel comfortable going there, uh, but identifying these concerns, then directing them to, to their primary care so they can explore these issues if there's anything underlying these challenging behavior. So what I'm hearing is tread lightly on identifying or labeling and merely point out what the teacher may be seeing in a classroom and saying this might need further investigation. If a student has been identified, and let's pretend that parents are willing and able to provide the appropriate treatment and have the appropriate resources and professionals in place, how can teachers tell whether that treatment plan is actually working? I'm a big believer in measurement-based care. When we have core symptoms of ADHD, HD at onset, we would like to get rid of them, just like we would in any disorder. If somebody comes in and says, I wheeze when I breathe, and it's terrible when I get a cold, and sometimes I wake up at night short of breath, mm -hmm. we're not satisfied until all three of those are addressed. In fact, when we care for patients with asthma, we don't just want those symptoms addressed. Care standards now mean that we don't want those symptoms to happen in mild form. We want them to be physiologically normal at every test. We don't want it to ever get as bad as a symptom, but we don't even want it to get pre-symptomatic. We want it to be normal. That's the best care for asthma. If we're gonna adopt the same for ADD, which has 18 core symptoms, mm -hmm. and everybody with 80 dozens of other symptoms that they brought with them at diagnosis. Some kind of systematization is important. I have a 36 item questionnaire that parents do every visit. We want to get the scores as low as possible. There's some standards. There's been some testing that suggests 50% symptom score reduction is an important point in care. But how, how about 90%? Why wouldn't we shoot for 90. We really want losing things and trouble organizing to be minimal, if ever present, just like people who don't have ADD. First off, we need a robust definition of treatment response, which is as close to normal as we can achieve with our combination of methods. To that end, teachers have, in one way, an easy job. If given a form, just Fill it out the way you filled it out last time. A lot of these long forms are best done. Here's my gut level impression. It's happening a lot. It's not happening much. But being willing to fill in the database for ADHD kids is an important first. Every teacher has different insights, and teacher insights are awfully important. Making sure that discomforts or praises get communicated to the parents so that they get to the rest of the professional team. The other broad indicators that we see is also whether the anxiety is better. We should have been talking about the whole time because anxiety is so prevalent in inattentive ADD. Making sure that anxiety doesn't increase is very important in treatment plans with stimulant medications. Teachers are good at picking up anxiety, much better than at picking up inattention. Teacher feedback on anxiety is important in this process. This is really about taking really good care of our kiddos. I know exactly. that every teacher watching to this is committed to that. What message do you want to leave teachers with? Some ins inspiration, some reassurance, whatever comes up for you. Viewing these children with compassion can go a very long way. The kid who is redirected gently or nicely knows that means you want to be as sensitive to that as possible. So the lens of compassion is critical and it can make a big difference in the lives of these children. Thank you so much. Oren, how about you? I want to go back to the intuition. When a teacher has an intuition that a child is working harder than what 
seems to be working harder than what they seem to be producing. That's the first and most important thing to tell parents. Your child is working hard and not getting the progress. I feel bad about that. I'm not the diagnostician here. This brings up many questions about learning disabilities, learning capabilities, mm -hmm. and so forth. But I hate to see her struggle. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm noticing. Just an invitation to discuss it and to seek help without naming names, without proposing diagnoses, but begin with compassion, begin with heartfelt, we all want the best, and I see struggle. And that applies to kiddos who we, primary school all the way through high school, correct? College students, graduate students, wives, husbands. ADHD is a lifelong I, It has just been such a pleasure talking to both of you today. And I'm sure that teachers everywhere are going to appreciate hearing your insight about something that is tricky, even for parents to notice what about inattentive ADHD. Hello, my name is Cynthia Hammer, and I'm the executive director of the Inattentive ADHD Coalition. Its website is www.iadhd.org. It looks like you're starting a journey to learn ab more about inattentive ADHD. And I highly recommend that you read my book, Living with Inattentive ADHD. It's been highly praised by a number of national ADHD authorities, and all royalties from the book are going to benefit the Inattentive ADHD Coalition. This has been a production of Inattentive ADHD Coalition. Check us out at iadhd.org and see how you can help us by donating or by spreading awareness about inattentive ADHD.